Hi everyone, it's Jerry. In this video, I'm going to show you the key game that propelled the 17-year-old Gukesh D of India into the history books. This was his penultimate round game against Ali Reza Faruja from the 2024 candidates. This round 13 win made him the sole leader by a narrow half point for the first time in the event. And this would be a position he'd hang on to after the dust settled in the final round. In that 14th and final round, Gukesh held comfortably with the black pieces against Nakamura. And after the other very closely watched roller coaster game between Karwana and Yupomnishi was drawn, Gukesh stood at the top all by himself with 9 out of 14 points. That is 5 wins, 1 loss, 8 draws. In what way did he make history? Well, he will now be the youngest challenger ever for a World Chess Championship title. He will soon face Ding Loren. So let's see this key game, Gukesh's fifth and final win. We kick off with e4, Ray Lopez, Berlin defense. Now the first couple of phases, a pretty technical approach by each side. Not a great shift in the eval either way. It's not until the endgame phase where we see a hiccup by Team Black. Pair of knights off. In this game, we see the C pawns each take a step to drive the bishop away. Now, do know these C pawn advances are not just about, hey, I want to attack a bishop. Uh, to be sure, at this level, moves are frequently played with more than one idea in mind. So, what is an additional point behind these C pawn advances? Well, each side is now in a spot to advance in the center, creating a pawn duo. There is value in creating a central pawn duo. In fact, this bishop b3 anticipates a possible d5. No longer hits with tempo. a5, knight c4. Black preserves the bishop, of course. And in this position, we have knight e3. I want to draw your attention to a technical note here. I think many players may look at a position like this and uh, may say, you know, at some point I'll probably need a flight square. Maybe now's a good time to create a flight square. Why is h3 not a good time to produce a flight square? You might also reason, in fact, playing h3, you cut out any knight or bishop jumps. Now's not a good time, and here's why. It's because black can play b5, and then a4, and your bishop is kicked away from this beautiful diagonal. And this guy right here has, however slight it may seem, a cramping effect on white, allowing a rook pawn to be established in your house, something to not take lightly. So white anticipates this b5 push, plays knight e3, says if b5 is played, I have time to react. In the game, black castles. If black plays b5 here, white's in a spot to respond with a4, maintaining the bishop on this beautiful diagonal and not allowing a4. Okay, it's a minor detail, but, you know, at this level, these inches, let's say, add up. Castles, queen of three and d5. So the queen f3 move is supporting a knight f5 jump, but the knight doesn't jump in there straight away. In the game, we have bishop c2, a bit of an odd-looking move. Uh, just a moment ago, I was pointing out how the bishop is excellent on this diagonal. Why does Gukesh play bishop c2 in this position? Why doesn't white play knight f5 is maybe another way to look at it. Here's why. It's because black can take the knight, take on e4, and then play queen d3, develop, developing with tempo. And how do you defend e4? It's a bit awkward defending e4 in this position. So the bishop c2 move anticipates this variation where the queen eventually ends up on d3. That's no longer a possibility for black. 
It's only at this point that Black says, you know what, fine, I'm not going to allow your knight into f5. It's under control. In fact, it's more than just the knight that is under control. It's also the bishop on c1. If the knight doesn't see the world, or if the knight doesn't have a forward move, the bishop doesn't see the world. From here, rook e1, bishop e6, a couple exchanges in the center. Now, much different time here for a flight square, move 17. Rook e8, bishop a4, another set of pawns comes off. Rook e7, and finally, uh, white's making some room for this dark square bishop. Queen c7, bishop b3, both black bishops are very good, so they're both going to be challenged soon enough. a4. This guy right here on a4 is poison. Here's why. If you take the pawn, in comes bishop c4. And bishop takes knight, removing a key dark square defender of the king side. Don't take with the king. Queen c4 would win the bishop. And if you take with the rook, bishop b8 would follow. How are you stopping queen h2? g3 would get blasted with e3. This is extremely flimsy. This is winning. This would be winning for black. So, don't bite. We have the light square bishop exchange. And now bishop e3, a3, met with c4. Angling now for f4, that's cut out. Bishop c5 and b3. Each side takes this you know, you take me approach. White wants to improve with the knight. Black would like to improve with the queen. Okay, the tension remains. F5. Queen is helped a tick. We get on with more development. The queen rooks are finally playing. Rook d5 is an excellent post for the rook. Gets in there with tempo. Queen e7. This next move I really like. I'll throw it to you as a pop quiz. What move would you play here as white? Feel free to pause the video. Okay, move played here, f4. We have a change of the structure. Now, you really have to weigh these new structures carefully. f4 uh, is giving black a connected passed pawn, but white is in a spot to conveniently blockade it. The white knight is a blink away from occupying e3. The knight is the most efficient defender of a connected passed pawn. A reason for this, it's not strictly, it's not a strictly defensive piece. It exerts pressure on the defender of the pawn. This uh, f5 point could be undermined with g4 at some stage active defense. There's no time to take en passant, by the way, because we have a problem. There's a pin here along the e-file. So a structural change in this one with f4. Uh, also, a point behind this is that f4 is stopping black from playing f4. So if white, for instance, in this position let's say, doubled rooks on the d-file. This starts to get really dangerous for white. This pawn advancing here. Pressure on g3. What are we doing about this? Is e3 happening soon? Could very easily see this position collapse for white. But white stops that cold with a timely f4. In comes knight f6. Rook is kicked back. g5, knight e3. There's pressure now on f5. Now, this is a point black has to watch over by pieces. Um, if black doesn't play in this way, I mean, if he still keeps this pawn controlling f5, I'm going to make some passing moves. If, let's say, the king moved here and then just went back, this is a move you could maybe be considering, g4. And this is a way to really grab black's attention. F5 will need some defense now by pieces. 
active defense, this block hater here on e3. All right. We do have g5, knight e3. These are both soft points now. Have to watch over them with the pieces. A new open file here because of the g-pawns exchange. King is much cozier on h2. Some defense over f4. Rook g6, rook d5. Knight g7. Have to do something about f5. White was converging on it. Not the happiest square for the knight, but it's still around even. Now, an interesting point right around here. Pay close attention to these next moves. They could very easily just fly under the radar. You might think, ah, no big deal. What's, yeah, they're just shuffling, but I want to draw attention to this here. We have rook on e to d1, rook h6, rook g1, rook g6. Rook goes back to d1, rook h6. Also take note of the moves. We have just met time control. Now it may seem that Gukesh is just repeating moves just to get to time control, and that may be true. But if you look back at a look back at one of his other games from this event, round five against uh, Abasov, he repeated moves when it was around move twenty eight, and he he only had Gukesh only had about five minutes remaining. He eventually gets to this point where he says, essentially, no draw. He's not content, in other words, with some threefold repetition. And I think this is in large part because of this event. Uh, you really do have to go and try, try and rack up as many wins as you can. And he certainly did rack up a bunch of wins in this one. His fifth win here in this round 13 game. Um, so he's really going for it. I mean, it reminds me of, you know, Magnus. He's not uh, one to just take a draw. He really goes for it. And we're seeing that on more than one, one occasion, or we at least saw that on more than one occasion in this event. So queen h4, the no draw for you move. Game on. He's okay having his king pulled to this open file. In other words, for just a moment, he gets off of it. And now with, it's interesting, just a moment ago, the king went to h2. He's no longer returning to h2. Why is he choosing to go left <laughs> a little bit more towards the center? Well, there's now one less piece around. The position is a little less complicated, you may say. A little bit more simplified. One less piece around. Maybe the king feels a little bit more comfortable hugging this knight, providing some security for what was an unprotected knight. All right, from here, rook to g8. So this is where black starts to go astray. The suggestion is to play queen g6, anticipating possible queen improvements. Queen h6, queen g5. Rook g8 is met with queen g5, considered better was queen to h6, but okay, queen g5 is here exerting more pressure on f5. There's three pieces targeting f5 at this point. Black's reply is queen g6. Uh, this is essentially the losing move in this game. What's considered best is knight e6, preparing to meet queen takes f5 with queen g7. Now, there's a couple ideas in mind after queen g7. One is to enter on one of these two squares or even sneak in here for some perpetual check ideas. Uh, if queen here, black can exchange and then get some rook activity like this. Now, this is exactly what uh, black would like to have in this endgame, a very active rook in other words but watch how passive the black rook ends up being in this one doesn't get this activity and soon it's actually going to be gukesh who has not only a very active rook but he's going to be up a pawn after rook d6 move 47 there's no way to hang on to this material 
What's tried in this game? Rook to e8. What happens if the pawn is defended? Well, this rook can come over to b6, and how are you defending b7? This is really sad. <laughs> Putting the rook on b8. Um, look at this position. The rook is a monster on b6. Keeping pressure here, stopping the knight from improving. Uh, completely passive rook. This is not a fifth, or this is not a five-point rook. Really can't play in that way. Another try, you may think knight e8, allowing defense like this, that could be met with rook e6. And now black is completely frozen. Pressure here and here restricts the rook, has to stay pegged to g8. If the king tries to improve, the rook can step up to e7 and track the b pawn. What other moves would be left here for black after the rook is on e6? Knight g7 drops the g-pawn, and knight c7, there's rook b6. Soon, a black pawn is going to fall one way or the other. Super active rook. You might also say white is a tick better king position-wise as well. No queens on board, this is exactly where the white king wants to be. Alright, close to the center is the name of the game for the kings in the end games especially with no queens on. So there goes the g-pawn, knight e6, the f-pawn is defended, and it's essentially just a one position now for team white. Knight c2, I believe, was banking on uh, escorting this e-pawn all the way down to promotion land, but white has uh, a sneaky idea up his sleeve. Let's see what that is. Rook takes b. The reply to that is rook to e6. Rook e6 defends f6. Why is this important? Well, if black tries to just run right away with the e-pawn and scare the king away, yeah, this guy's going to be able to get a queen, but while black is busy getting a queen, white would be delivering what's known as the Arabian mate. Take a picture of this. Position here if you like. Take out your phone. A rook on the 7th rank. King in the corner and the knight. Two squares away diagonally. We're setting up a, an Arabian mate. Very strong idea here. Black has to address that threat. There is no time, in other words, to get a queen. Rook e6 stops knight f6. Stops the Arabian mate. And white says, well, I'm up a pawn. Let's trade some more. And this guy is also in a spot to address the pawn advance. No rook exchange. Instead, rook h6 is played. If we do have a rook exchange in knight b4, white is much faster. Not only is the pawn faster, but when it promotes, it stings. So, rook h6. Past pawns must be pushed. We get some repetition in there. Do know at this point beyond move 40, when you make a move, you're gaining 30 seconds. So a quick minute was picked up there by Gukesh with the king shuffle. G2, F2. And now it's back on with pushing the past pawns. And one little note here, which pawn to advance with? B pawn is best. You don't allow. Uh, any knight sacrifice for these two pawns. You go with c6, it's still winning if black goes for that, but it's not even necessary. You go with the b pawn and then get the rook out of the way of the b pawn. Rook c7 is perfect. And one final trick here by Feruja. Don't put your king on e3 here unless you want to get mated. That one would certainly sting, but of course, Gukesh is not falling for that. King g3 is the final move of this one. Feruja resigns. If the game continued, what does black have here? If you try to track the pawn down and then get here in time, initially you might think, oh, you give a check and then advance the pawn. No, white could do one better. 
interfere. It's going to be mate soon enough. All black has are these silly checks. Check here, check there. The king on h5 cools a cucumber soon enough. b8 is going to be mate. So, what did you think of this one? I think Gukesh is well beyond his years. What do you think? And what is your uh, prediction for this upcoming historic World Chess Championship match? Anyhow, feel free, as usual, to leave any feedback in the comment section below. Hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care. Bye.